Welcome to what happened on Saturday with Marlon Kerner. And obviously we are joined by a very special guest today, the one and only John Fina. John, how you doing? I'm doing great. No complaints. There you go. I'm going to introduce you here a little bit, John, for people that don't know. Uh, you attended Sal Point Catholic High School, where you were first team All State your senior year, and you had your uh, jersey retired. At, you know, in high school, you then attended the University of Arizona, where you were drafted 27th overall by the Bills uh, in the 1992 draft. Played in two Super Bowls, were a stalwart on the offensive line for damn near a decade for the for the Bills. We're kind of here to talk to you today about your U of A days, uh, your take on the state of college football. And obviously your son, who's tearing it up at UCLA and just the recent bowl game, the LA Bowl on Saturday night. So, Marlon, uh, take it away with your buddy here. John, I appreciate you coming on. So um, we do a little different show. Um, everybody talks about the Bills. Uh, so we like to talk a little bit about college football. So I know you went to South Point Catholic High School, but let, let's start there. Um, you play D-line and linebacker first. So let's talk about the high school days. Talk about that defining moment when you really said, hey, you know what? I think I can play at the next level. And then talk, walk us through like your recruiting experience, what it looked like um, getting recruited by U of A. I want to say Colorado State. I think you had New Mexico as some of the teams that were recruiting you. But what's it like being recruited as a West Coast guy? Wow. Well, a lot to unpack. Well, you remember, Marlon, you're only a few years younger than me. It was kind of the dark ages, right? So right. Uh, I, I grew up playing football. I have four older brothers and I was used to getting my head kicked in. And so, you know, I was always trying to fight for my share of anything, whether it was a sandwich or, you know, a blanket or what, what have you. So we, we grew up playing football out here in the dirt, you know, the dead grass and uh, to me, it was just a, a way to just let out energy, you know, just to really compete. I played, you know, five, six sports as a kid. I showed horses. I skied. I played soccer. I played baseball. I played a little basketball in high school. And I uh, the whole recruiting process actually came as a little bit of a surprise, you know, because in those days, they just didn't connect with you on Twitter. Right. Right. They actually just somebody showed up on campus and found the AD or the head coach and said, hey, I want to talk to this kid. And I was like, wow, this is pretty exciting. You know, I had no idea. Uh, it, it started with New Mexico and Colorado State. And then the U of A got into the mix. And I was like, wow, this is pretty great. You know, kid from a tiny little town, you know, nobody knows. And I got a chance to play at the next level. I was I was pretty tickled pink. Uh, U of A lost its coach over that new year. Uh, he went to USC and never called again. So <laughs> I thought for damn sure I would be a New Mexico Lobo or a Colorado State Ram. And then uh, Dick Tomey came in. They came out and watched me play basketball in high school and said, you know what, we're going to give you the last available scholarship. So as luck would have it, I made it to the U of A. And I was just thrilled. You know, I, I never really thought of, uh, playing football at the next level when I was in the current level. To me, I approached football the same way I did academics. I just, I didn't want to be beaten. I didn't want to not know the answer. I didn't want to have my ass kicked. So I just, you know, busted my butt. I was a D lineman for, I was a linebacker until they timed me in the 40. <laughs> this, is a, this is a visual joke for all your uh, listeners. I'm looking at my non-existent watch. And then they made me a D lineman. So I spent two and a half years on D line. I came back from, uh, from spring break. Um, and I couldn't find my locker. I went to 98 and it was somebody else's gear. And I was like, what's going on? So i just kind of wandered around the locker room, looking into the lockers. And then I found a locker with my stuff in it. I looked up and it was number 70. So I went down to the equipment guys and I, I said, hey, uh, I think there was a mistake. You guys put my gear in 70 and the 900-year-old equipment manager just goes, <laughs> you moved offensive line. <laughs> so that's how you found out. <laughs> that's how I found out. No meeting, no discussion, get home from spring break and you're an O-line. Did you take that as a demotion? Did you take that as, as a slight or as an opportunity? Oh, I was pissed, man. I, I just did not like offensive linemen. Complainers, crybabies, 
fat, pear shaped, yeah. nasty, disgusting. You know, I wanted to hit people. I want to knock people out, shed blocks, and make tackles. And now I'm like, I don't even, I don't know the first thing about offensive line play. Uh, and uh, well, I just said, what the hell? I'm here now. They're not going to change me back. So uh, I, I had uh, Ron McBride as my first offensive line coach. And then I got Pat Hill for my junior and senior year. And Pat was a real technician. And that's where I learned the intricacies of offensive line play, the philosophy, understanding the game. So that's when I got really excited about it. And Pat said to me after my junior year, you know, he and Pat's an OBS kind of guy. He says, yeah, you're getting pretty good at this. I said, thanks, coach. Appreciate that. He's like, you know, if you bust your ass this offseason, somebody might pay you to play this game. And I said, you're full of shit. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to pay me to play. I'm like 270-pound, skinny, weak, slow offensive lineman. He's like, come on, let's do it. I'll challenge you. So practice early, practice late, early morning meetings, after practice meetings, watching film, understanding the game better, and just really kind of, you know, making it uh, my life as far as like, what am I passionate about? And because of Pat's great coaching and the opportunity that was uh, afforded me, I, I just took advantage of it. It was, it was, uh, it was a dream when, when they started talking about me in the NFL in the same sentence, I just, I could hardly believe it. That is awesome. Now you mentioned something that just stuck out to me. So you make the switch and you talk about your coach and the technique for our listeners. Talk about the difference from being a defensive line and then going to do something the complete opposite. Now you're not, you're not just firing off the ball, trying to go get after a passer. You're dropping back. You've got to do run blocking. You've got to do pass sets and use your hand and, and, and be able to take on bull rushes, swim moves, spin moves, all those things. Talk about, the diff how you learned that technique and, and how long it took for you to kind of feel comfortable being able to pick all those techniques up and be able to play it and, and implement that in a game. Yeah. So for the casual observer of football, offensive line play doesn't look that intricate or that delicate or fine. But the truth is, you know, we work in six inch movements, right? You take the wrong step, you make a step too big and it really defines what's going to happen to you on the rest of the play. Because we, although we dictate the first movement, we're very reactive. So outside the quarterback position, the two hardest positions to play on, 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 on the field are cornerback and tackle, right? Because you're right. just basing everything you do on a split second, you know, reaction from what you just did. And, you know, it, it is a very refined position. The coaching in offensive line play, thank God, has evolved, like, incredibly since the 1980s. Um, you know, the technique that's being taught, the philosophy that's being taught, just positioning the different types of philosophies for pass pro, run blocking, you know, they're all, they all fit in a box. But from one end of the box to the other end of the box, you know, there are some, there are some, rubs in there where you say, well, that's not, that, that's not my game. Well, that's my game. Okay. So how are you going to accentuate that? So all the way from when I coach the kids and I coach high school, a little bit offensive line play, I always train their eyes first. I always tell you, you know, your focus, your, your hands are going to go where your eyes go. So make sure your focal point is exact. If it's low enough, it brings you down. Cause as, as we all know, we get tired, we start standing up. Mm -hmm. So I train kids to play low, play with their eyes, and, and, you know, strike, good balance, just, you know, good width in their feet. And there is a lot to it. And I think the guys that get good at it really dedicate themselves. They have, a, they have a, an understanding of the philosophy of the assignment and the play. And when I'm coaching, I coach, you know, five kids, offensive line, right? And a couple of times I'm watching them, like, they just don't get it. So I line them up and I said, all right, turn around, face the backfield. This is what we're trying to achieve, right? So this is why I'm asking you to do this. Not just do it because I can scream louder than you or I'm taller or I'm older. This is why we're doing it. And I think the why with the philosophy in the game has evolved, you know, magically. And that's why these guys coming out, they're big, they're strong, but they're technicians. They're really good technicians. Maybe you can uh, share with us some stories about going to U of A 
Uh, you know, Marlon is, is, you know, talked quite a bit about the Big Ten. We focus a lot about the Big Ten on the show. There's the big bad SEC. West Coast football, the Pac-12 this year was fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's going away. <laughs> and I'd lo love your thoughts on that. But talk to me about going to Arizona, you know, some of the rivalries out there, playing in nice weather, uh, you know, the, the bear down defense. You know, they had a great home field advantage back then. Like, what what was it like for you there? And, you know, would you, would you do it all over again and go there? Well, you know, I, there's about a dozen things in my life that I would change, but that that wouldn't be one of them, right? Because it, it led me to Buffalo, and it led me to you know playing in the in the NFL, which is an incredible honor. Yeah, you asked a lot of questions there, so I'll try to go backward a little <laughs> bit. Um, you know, I, I grew up hating every other team. It, it was once the Pac-10, now the Pac-12, which is now the Pac-2, which will soon become nothing. And by the way, that was a mercy killing. Uh, you know, we hate ASU right up the road. Phoenix just despise them in state rivalry as Man. heated as Ohio state and Michigan. Um, you know, the iron bowl, it, it ranks up there. There's some really poor behavior from the citizens of each city that surrounded that game historically, whether it was basketball, softball, or football. I, I tell you, I wouldn't have been shocked if there was some blood being spilt at a track meet between the two teams. I mean, it, it is bitter. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that rivalry stays intact. Uh, I just, when my son was being recruited and, you know, he was like UCLA and USC were his first big offer. You know, I kind of had to swallow hard. I was like, oh, man, I just, and now, I mean, I'm wearing powder blue and gold and I've got a Florida State shirt on because my daughter goes to graduate school there. I got a kid at NAU. I mean, my truck has bumper stickers all over the place. <laughs> uh, I, I'm so confused. I don't know where my allegiances are anymore. Uh, but it, it's been a wild ride. I, I think that, um, you know, the um, the conference matchups, and I don't know if you guys pay attention to Chip Kelly, but he came out and said there's no reason yep. why all the sports have to – and it makes such sense, and I've been saying that for a long time. Like, turn football into a club sport, fund it separately, then you can get back. You can still have Title IX with the rest of the sports. You can increase the funding for the rest of them, but there's enough money out there that can fund football and turn it into a quasi-club sport. Uh, with – with respect to the Big Ten, I mean, it's so funny because I, I thought, you know, think about my bucket list, right? Like, what do I want to do? What would be really cool? And I think before uh, I, you know, I leave this earth, I'd like to catch a game in every SEC and Big Ten stadium. So now that UCLA is going to be in the Big Ten, I think I'm going to be at uh, Happy Valley. I think I'm going to be at Bloomington. I mean, I'm just like, this is going to be so cool. I want to, I want to go see some of these stadiums, you know? Uh, so I'm, I, we're really excited about that. As with respect to the PAC 12 mercy killing, I, you know, I am, I'm a disruptor by nature. Um, they ran that conference so poorly and overpaid too many people, bad TV contracts. You know, a lot of people are, you know, teary eyed and, sentimental about seeing it go and i'm like uh, give me the shovel you know i'll start digging and i'll put the last shovel full on the coffin because it, it was embarrassing uh not the play but the scheduling like pack 12 after dark you live on you guys live on the east coast were you going to stay up till two o'clock in the morning to watch the end of a football game no only mm -hmm. Deion sanders only Deion sanders this year right marlon <laughs> I, and i fell asleep on that game <laughs> yeah i woke up like oh, oh it's overtime oh i'm glad i woke up <laughs> Exactly. So I, I am not going to miss it. I think that uh, the game is going to you know, continue to evolve with respect to the conferences like the, the college football playoff has already evolved, which it should have done, you know, five years, years ago. ago. Yep. Um, my daughter's school gets kicked to the curb because their quarterback gets hurt. You know, I think like they did that because they knew they'd never have to deal with it again. So they're like, all we have to do is take the heat for two weeks and it'll all be gone. Uh, I didn't think TCU belonged last year, and they were in it. So I like this new format. I, you know, the big things that are really just head scratchers are the, the transfer portal and the NIL money. And every day I think I understand it. You know, there's a new wrinkle or a new situation that makes me say, 
is this good for the kids? Is this good for college football? And and I don't know. But what I can say is 20 years ago, the NC2A in every college should have figured out a way to give Marlon Kerner 300 extra dollars on his scholarship check. They should have given him $2,500 a year into an IRA. And they should have let him personally buy health insurance from his institution for the rest of his life. And then they might have avoided all of this, but they just treated all these players like kept labor, right? In a box, right. make money off of them. Injuries, they don't care. They get load up, get another guy, right? What happens to them after they play? They don't care. And, you know, this uh, they deserve this. The NC2A, the whole football world deserved what we have. But now, like, when is it going to kind of regress to the mean? I don't know. You can't put it back in the box. You're right. It's out of the box. Uh, and, and I just had this conversation last week with someone where we talked about the NCAA had so many years to fix it. Um, they knew it was an issue. They got sued by so the O'Bannon brothers. So they could have fixed college football then saying, what, what are you what are you saying? You don't make enough money on the scholarship checks. Let's increase that. Uh, but it, it was we get billions of dollars. We get all this money from EA Sports. And then we had to lose our 2K um, college football games because they couldn't figure out how to compensate the players. Like, so you're right. I, I don't know how you put it back in there, but I do want to go back to what you talked about with Chip Kelly, because I saw that as well. And I've been talking about it. And Josh and I are definitely going to dive into this topic um, once the offseason gets here. But at some point, do you see a super conference coming out of all of this? Do you see the top 30 schools just kind of saying, listen, if we all come together, we can all just guarantee that half of the conference is going to play in the college football playoff. We all play against each other. We schedule some people non-conference, out-of-conference games, and we just go and play. And then the 15 of us will go fight it out and see who's going to be the top dog when it's all said and done. And they can kind of create the landscape of what college football is going to look like. And people will pay for it. Do you think we will ever get to that point? And if so, when? When do you think that will happen? I think you only get to that point if you if you see pressure from the schools saying, you know, we're, we're flying a gymnastics team all the way to Rutgers. Explain to me why that makes sense. Why, why can't we, you know, let's look at the dollars and, and, and then start to complain. And, but you can't just complain. You have to come forward with a plan. So all these schools, especially the ones out west that are going to be traveling so far, are going to really have to come together. You know, all the ADs, all the management, all the coaching, and that say, what can solve this? How can we preserve our local rivalries, but yet satisfy this need for football? Because that's the 500 pound gorilla, right? I mean, that makes right. all the money. Um, you know, and two things can be true you can walk and chew gum at the same time. But I don't, I don't see it happening soon because it's like um, academia, college athletics, it's all just one half step below government. And it's, you know, <laughs> inability to function properly, respond to the market, you know, go under budget. I mean, it, it, so it'll take a long time for it to evolve. But going back to what you said, a, a super or a mega conference, I think as long as it's it's somehow divided regionally with a few games within, right? So, right. you know, maybe pare it down to the Pac-10. Again, drop a school or two, and then you have three or four of those conferences that make up the 40 or 50 that are in – the super conference, but you keep some existing rivalries, but you take teams and yeah, you'd have to make two or three trips. You'd have to go to Rutgers. You'd have to go to Maryland. You know, you might have to go to Texas tech. So I think that it will eventually evolve, but they're never going to, they're never going to work that hard and figure it out with the problems that are glaringly in their face right now. They're going to have to wait for something to break. It takes it takes something to break before they ever address or fix it. John, before we uh, talk about your son Bruno at UCLA, Marlon's been gracious enough to not yet bring up September seventh, nineteen ninety one, a thirty eight to fourteen Ohio State <laughs> victory over the Arizona Wildcats. Uh, any memories of that game, John? You know, that's the game that put me on the map. Nice. Uh, I played against Alonzo Spellman. Who was Long, longest arms known to man, right? And and Six a terrific five. guy. Yes. Yep. I mean, probably 86 inch, maybe 90 inch wingspan. I'm in about an 80. And uh nobody knew who who I was. And we go there for the opener. I think it was the opener. Hotter than hell in Ohio State, man. Columbus was hot. 
And I just knew that I had a hard hill to climb against a guy who was a first round pick. This is a first round draft pick. I'm a nobody. And I went out and I played a damn good game against Alonzo Spellman. So I don't care what Marlon says. I could look back and say we lost 200 and nothing. I don't care. That's the game that put John Fina on the map. And I'll, I'll take 200 to nothing, 500 to nothing. That I would play that game and lose it again every time. Because what happened after that is all of a sudden my phone started ringing. And uh, that was pretty damn cool. That was pretty cool. That was my right. freshman year, by the way. So, you know, I wasn't thinking too much about it. You're looking at the roster. You're just looking. I just remember shaking Alonzo Spellman's hands the first time I met him. And literally his hands and his fingers, when he would dap you up, would come to your wrist. Um, so I was like, man, this is like the massive, the biggest human I've ever seen. Longest arms, as I mentioned. And I want to say he wore like a size 21 shoe. Um, and they had it like on display. So on the recruiting visit, as you're taking your visit through, your, they have like shoes sitting up there. And I'm like, whose shoe is that? Oh, that's Alonzo Spellman. You're like, oh my gosh, like a size 21 shoe. Um, craziest, like you said, gentle giant, really cool dude. Um, but yeah, I, I remember that game because um, it was my first year um, as a freshman at Ohio State and just kind of trying to get the atmosphere. Uh, and people don't think that it's hot in Columbus because we're Midwest, Ooh. but it gets hot. Like them dog days of summer um, and always asking the training staff, are we allowed to practice in this? We always did three days, by the way. Um, can you practice in this when the wet bulb says 98% humidity? And you're like, yeah, shut up, drink water. So I remember yeah. those days. <laughs> remember those days. But let's 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 switch gears, as Josh mentioned. Now, your son, um, who I got to meet uh, when you first came back uh, to Buffalo, um, young Bruno. Um, like, let's let's talk through that. Like, when did he start playing football? You did you coach him in high school? Like, what was that like when he started going to getting recruited and said, hey, I, I think I can play at the next level? Um, and what was how how different was it from when you got recruited um, as an athlete? Yeah, well, let's start with that. So uh, back when we got recruited, people just had to show up to your high school. Now that, you know, they, they connect with the kids on Twitter. Right. Bruno told me, yeah, I was talking to the coach at Purdue and talking to the coach at Iowa State. And I was like, what? Wait, what? I, I told him, no, I'm not interested. And I was like, well, I mean, they just no permission, no, nothing like they used to do. But Bruno wanted to play youth football for about four years. And I said, I am not letting you play until I can go out there and coach because I remember some of the coaching I had and it wasn't great. So I coached him for two years of youth football. And you remember Marlon. I mean, he was a string bean. He's right. like, he's a spitting image of me. Uh and then uh, we get to high school, and I fortunately I got asked to coach, so I coached him as a freshman. I coached him at JV, <clears throat> and then the coach asked me to come up to varsity, so I keep coaching him. And uh, I'm a I'm a little bit of a pragmatist to uh, give you a straight shooter, and you know he played JV, so now kids who are going to college they play varsity as freshman or JV, but Bruno was you know six foot three, 104 pounds, and he had to play JV. So he starts getting into his, his junior year, varsity year. And he's like, how come nobody's paying attention to me? And I'm like, who the hell are you? <laughs> you got no film. I mean, you want to, you want to get recruited? Let's do it. Let's sit down. I pulled up every D one college. I said, where do you think you fit? And we start looking at Reno. We start looking at San Diego state, you know, some smaller schools here and there. And then, uh, you know, I just said, you just just listen with two ears, close your mouth, and let me coach you, and you're going to become a good football player. So by the time his, uh, you know, his junior year ends, we had B. John Robinson, who everybody knows, and we had uh, uh, Lathan, right, who's mm -hmm. at Ohio State, Lathan Ransom. Yes. So every coach in America was coming to Tucson, Arizona to look at B. John and Lathan, and one coach walks in, sees this kid in the weight room and says, who's that big, tall, white kid over there? Oh, that's Bruno Fina. He says, is that any relation to John Fina? He's like, that's his kid. He's like, I want to talk to that kid. So sure as you can bet, turns out it's Justin Fry, offensive line coach, Ohio State, who was with UCLA at the time. So head coach calls me, says, hey, um, I just talked to the offensive line coach from UCLA. And I was like, oh, okay. He's like, he wants you to call him. I said, for what? 
He's like, idiot, he wants to talk about Bruno. <laughs> and I'm like, holy cow. So I called Justin on my drive home, and he's like, I just want your permission to recruit your kid. I think he's going to be a great football player. I almost crashed my car. <laughs> I'm like tingling all over. And I'm like, and he, he's, he was like old school. I want your permission. I'm going to do it the right way. And I was like, holy smokes. I get home. I tell my wife, I said, you're not going to believe who I just got out the phone with. Offensive line coach, UCLA. She's like, oh, what were you talking about? I was like, your son, Bruno. And she's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she, she said, Bruno? And I said, yeah. <laughs> she's like, really? <laughs> I, was, I was like, we were just blown away. So we, uh, Bruno had a, a, a really nice visit out there. We visited USC. He got an offer. All of a sudden, your stock just starts to go through the roof. Right. We took the visits, met Chip Kelly, loved Chip Kelly, loved Justin Fry, the LA thing, the UCLA thing really fit for Bruno. And uh, it was it was just like a magical sequence of events. It was so much fun. And the whole family got involved. It was it was really cool. We had uh, your your old line mate, Jerry Ostrowski, came on and talking about his son playing at Tulsa. And I asked him this question, and I wanted to ask you this question, you know, as we wrap this up here with you. What's it like watching, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're playing yourself, when you're coaching kids, what's it like watching your son? How much, how much more nerve wracking is that for you? Oh, it's horrible. I mean, I sit in the stands like hyper focused, like locked up, like every muscle in my body is flexing, even my ears. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm focused on every play, but I have no control whatsoever. You know, when I played, I knew, Hey, it was on me. And I, you know, I, I'm watching the game from I know the position, right? So it's not like I'm watching it with blinders on, with no idea what he's doing. So, you know, every time he has, you know, an average play or a below average play, I'm just like, ah, you know, I feel like I took an arrow in the chest, you know, and I'm just like freaking out. But then I feel like, say, remember, you gave up a sack. Remember, you missed a block, you know, but it, it's really hard. And now I'm coaching his younger brother. So I got Roman, who's going to be a senior next year, who's, I mean, he's bigger and longer than Bruno was. Now the challenge is he had to play JV because he was a string bean like me. But uh, uh, this kid's got a chance too. So it's it's pretty exciting in the FINA household with respect to football, I have to say. But Marlon, you you remember Bruno. He probably weighed about 212 pounds yeah, when he, he was came a out there. When I met him, yeah. Yeah. yeah let's see Pippen he's scales a, at now. He's about 297. Okay. All righty. Yeah. He's looking right. good, man. He's looking good. Now, you mentioned Roman. I mean, is there any Buckeyes, you know, in the future for, for Roman? Like, you know, can, can 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 I put the bug in Ohio's ear early now and just kind of say, I got an inside guy for you now? Yeah, sure. You could do that. But I, I'm like I said, I like to be honest. I like to be a pragmatist. Right. So right. Bruno was a de Bruno was a development kid. Right. You don't come into college at 230 offensive line and play. Right. You need to be yeah. in a program that says, you know what, I project three years for this kid. Right. So Ohio State, Alabama, Michigan, those types of schools with respect to the, the transfer portal can plug and play. They can go out and just pull a new guy in, right? You lose your left tackle. You're concerned about the guy behind him. Just go shopping, man. Just go shopping. And now, as crazy as it is, and I didn't say this out loud, although this is probably being recorded, it's like take the credit card and go shopping. Because mm -hmm. Yeah, because NIL I mean, money changes things. NIL money changes all of how that – that college free agency works right now. We can call it transfer portal one to it. It's just, I like to call it like it is college free agency. Um, and you can go out and say, right. hey, you know what? Hey, I got two years. You got one year left. I can give you an NIL for one year. Or I can give you a two year NIL deal and get you here in our program. So it's, it's interesting. I'm curious because I know we're getting close up to the time, but you talked about coaching Bruno and what it is. What are those conversations like after the game? Does he call you and kind of say, hey, dad, what do you think? How do I do? What can I do to improve? Does he get your opinion um, after those games? And and you're the pragmatist. So, so, all right, how's that go? Like, are you straight shooting it to him? Or are you kind of like, do this and do that? Like, walk us through some of those conversations. Yeah, so, I mean, I've been watching spring football practice tape for the past three years. You know, we get on – that's the beauty of technology, right? So we just get on a – 
a Zoom or a, a FaceTime call, and he just aims the damn thing at his iPad. And he, you know, we go through plays and we watch plays. We talk a we talk a lot of philosophy, lots of um, you know technique kind of stuff. So it's it's been amazing. I talked to him during the. No, we cut off right there at the thirty minute mark exactly with John. Hopefully, uh, right, he comes back with us. That was a uh, pretty interesting. Like I can't imagine having my son played the same position, you know, like how right. uh, Jerry's son is playing D end, which, you know, is, is in the ballpark, but not exactly the same. A lot of pressure on Bruno, right. To, to, to you know, your dad is an NFL, you know, great NFL player for over 10 years. Exactly. Like, that's a tough, that's a tough spot to be in. We'll, uh, we'll drop John out here. And then if he, uh, if he's able to kind of, to come back in with us here, we'll, uh, we'll obviously, you know, have him rejoin us. Not sure what happened. Marlon, uh, you, you were talking about the Chip Kelly thing, and that that kind of took everybody by storm. For anybody who hadn't heard it, he basically broke down in about 90 seconds why he should be the commissioner of college football, it felt like. Yes. 64 teams, eight divisions. You play a division, you know, at, you, on a rotation. You play your own seven teams, and then you play one of the other divisions on a rotation of every seven years, and you have two home games, two away games, and then you play one FCS team, and there you go. There's 12 games. Sounded too easy? <laughs> uh, too easy, right? I'm not going to say it wasn't too easy. I, I think it was the first plan of that super conference that we have been alluding to to kind of get the teams that are just about football, right? Like the NCAA has already thrown out the one bill about this allow teams that are – that agree to kind of change some rules because they want to change NIL and they want to change the transfer portal because they feel like it's out of control. Right. Uh, and so back when I came and when John Fina was in, what always happened was you were on scholarship and then all of a sudden you had four, they had you for four years, but a four one year renewable scholarship. So as we see, John was back in, um, sorry, you froze. So we started talking about Chip Kelly a little bit, but uh, we would definitely defer to you on, what those conversations look like with uh, young Bruno. Yeah, we talk every almost every day. We still look at film. I don't know if you heard what I said about watching spring ball tape. Mm -hmm. You know, we, and, and the beauty of uh, offensive line coaching now is you, you really can dial it in to, look, that step is too big by about, it's, just, it's too big by four inches, and it's off the wrong angle by like 20 degrees. You know, this is where your foot needs to be every time. Right. So you got to go do that, you know, 100 times today and 100 times consecutively for the next 20 days. It has to become muscle memory. So we talk a lot about philosophy, uh, you know, and find out where his head's at. You know, it's kind of a rough year for UCLA. A few games they should have won that they just didn't mm -hmm. just didn't. Right. I mean, they had quarterbacking problems. And as you guys know, at every level now, high school, college pro, you know, you got to have a great quarterback if you're going to be great. If you have just okay quarterbacking, you're going to struggle. So our, our conversations are mostly about, you know, how can I get better? What, what can I improve on? And, you know, we talk a little bit about the team and where that headspace is. But, you know, for me and for him, I, I'd say the same things over and over. You're at UCLA to get the one of the best college degrees in the world, right? You're there to make the contacts and prepare for the next 40 years of your life. Now, at the same time, you're preparing for the opportunity to maybe play at the next level. And if you don't, it doesn't make you any less of a football player. It doesn't change who you are. So few guys get to go play in the NFL. This is not the barometer for you. The barometer for you is the next 40, 50, 60 years. Let's focus on what you have to do school-wise. We'll talk about football. We'll get you better. But, you know, revel in your victories, uh, dissect and forget your failures, right? Use it as a right. springboard, springboard, launch into the next opportunity. It's good advice for anybody. John, now, before we let you go, can you tell people where they can find your show, uh, you know, with Joe Miller, uh, Off Tackle with John Fina, and when you guys record and how they can find you? Absolutely. First of all, you can find me on Twitter at John Fina. I like to keep it light and fun. Don't come at me with too many serious topics because I'll – probably not answer them. Uh, our uh, podcast is called The Off Tackle Show with John Fina. We are live on YouTube um, Monday nights, 8, 8 p.m. East, 6 p.m. Mountain, which is where I am. 
And it's uh, you can go download the podcast in audio format, Spotify, Apple, whatever. I never do it, so I don't know where it is. <laughs> or you could just go to YouTube and you can watch this beautiful mug deliver some pretty hilarious content. We do we do try to keep it light and fun, and our shows are uh, our, our shows are inspired by the comments and uh, the people around us. So it, it's a fun show. Great. Can your, you dog, the dog? your dog approves. Your dog, your, dog, yeah. your dog approves of that message. <laughs> yeah, he's killing me. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for <laughs> thanks so much for joining us, John. Yes. Always you, great John. to see you, Josh Marlin. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Thanks. Take care. I'll talk to you soon. Merry Christmas and happy new year. Merry Christmas Absolutely. And happy new year too. Absolutely. Take care, buddy. All right. Well, the dog did not agree with this, the friendly, smiling face there. He is he definitely not a Buckeye that. fan. He is yeah. like, I hear a Buckeye in the background, and I don't like that's, it. That's amazing. So, you know, like, do you think, you know, if one of your sons was going to play, you know, big-time college football like that, would you – how would you have played it? You know, we have, like, the Jerry – Jerry Ostrowski who told us he's kind of hands-off. You know, he's not – he wasn't – he didn't coach his son. Uh, he's, you know, watching from the stands, you know, I don't know how much film review he does with his son. John obviously is, is the opposite of that. And right. he's real hands on with, with, with Bruno. And how, how would you have played that being a former, you know, athlete, former player, like there's kind of a two schools of thought, neither one's right. Neither one's wrong. I probably would have been, um, probably more like Jerry. Um, my youngest ended up playing football, uh, mm -hmm. and he, I, I try to be more hands off. Like I kind of said, if this is what you want to do, I'm always here. Um, you you can ask me any question you want. Um, he was definitely um, probably around my height. So I was like, you know, probably more of a corner safety style. Um, he just didn't have uh, the necessary, like the foot speed, foot speed. He didn't have my foot speed. He didn't run as fast as I did. Um, although he still thinks he can beat me in a 40. Um, <laughs> and and at my age, he probably could now. But give me some time to train and I will give him a run for his money. Um, so I hope he's listening because anytime, any day. Uh, but I, I, I try to stay out of it because. I wanted them to understand, like, I can't protect you on a football field. Now, had somebody said, hey, I want you to come and coach and, and, and help get everybody there, I may have decided to take him up on that. Um, I agree there were definitely some, some bad coaches. So for me, he didn't play Little League football because he was never interested in it. It's just he got to middle school one day and he said, I want to play football. Uh, and that was kind of like, okay, are you sure you want to play football? Or are you just planning to play with my friends? I just want to play football with my friends. So for me, I kind of thought, okay, well, this may be something that will – he may not be that serious about it yet. So kind of let him kind of figure it out, like let him find his own pathway, see where he wanted to be. He started as a uh, he was a little as as we like to say, he's a little chunky um, as a as a young teenager trying to figure it out. Uh, so he didn't he didn't grow and he didn't sprout up yet and didn't get lean until they got to high school. So he started playing offensive lineman. And I'm like, but you're not really, you're never going to be six, three, six, four. That's sure. not you. Right. So I knew he was going to switch, but I just waited for him to tell me he was ready to go and figure it out. And so I was always kind of, uh, I told my wife, like, I, I will be here. I will train them, but they have to want to do it. Like I was never going to make somebody get up and say, Hey dad, um, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say, here's your training schedule. Go do this. Right. It would have to be like, Hey dad, can you take me to the gym? Dad, can you take me to the field and work me out? Um, and all of my kids were different. Uh, so I just kind of let them figure it out. Uh, and then he came and went and college ended and he played at Lancaster. Uh, but uh, it wasn't anything where it ended up being like, okay, he's going to play at the next level. Um, it was kind of like, all right, you're going to play high school football and that's it. And you're done. Uh, and so he's now um, a freshman at college, just kind of figuring out what the next step's going to be. Um, but his football career kind of really ended uh, in high school. But I'm definitely more hands off. I didn't get into the play my son more. I kind of, I would ask questions like, well, why, why is this person, you know, what do you have to do? Like, give me feedback to give him. Um, but that'd be about it. Like I wouldn't really say too much. I was very, very hands off and allow coaches to kind of do what they needed to do. And that's, that's, that's good. You know, that's, that's a credit to you. Cause I can, I can sure see some scenarios where, you know, if you're coaching the son of, a, of, a, of an NFL guy and you played here, you know, and, and John obviously has a bunch of credibility being a 10 year, 12 year NFL vet. I'm sure Jerry could, could give his opinion yeah. if he wanted to, <laughs> you know, you, you would know where Jerry stands on things. It's gotta be kind of some pressure for some of these high school coaches, right? Like, you know, you right. certainly weren't, weren't breathing down his neck, but you're Marlon Kerner. You played in the NFL. You've got a credibility that, you know, a lot of other parents don't. And like, if I'm a high school coach, not that I'm looking over my shoulder, but Hey, you know, your opinion matters. Like, I, I guess I, I give you a lot of credit for being able to kind of step back and, and not want to kind of run that show and, and kind of take over there. Yeah, I mean, that was never really my thing. Um, I think every scenario is different, right? Like, 
Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, uh, Arizona, Ohio, Pennsylvania, like though Texas, Florida, you know, those are places where football is a little different. Like we love our football here. We have our bills here. But high school football and college football is not the same. Um, and what they do and how they practice and how they get ready to play um, for the following season is not the same. So I knew that coming here, like, oh, this is just different. Like, this is totally different. Uh, and, and so, you know, I just kind of said, you know what? I, I never really wanted to coach um, football. Like, I've had opportunities. I knew some coaches, you know, and I kind of walked in and we just kind of looked at some things. And I, I'll never forget, like, my first experience 20 plus years ago uh, with the coach. And I remember... You know, he's like, hey, just come check out, you know, would love to have you come out, you know, and, and and here it's a little different. Like when I was trying to decide if I really wanted to decide coaching or not, um, which I was leaning more towards no, uh, it was you had to be a teacher. You had to be within the school to get those positions where growing up in Ohio, so many positions could be given away to uh, somebody that maybe wasn't affiliated with the school district, or wasn't a teacher. So you can kind of get the best of both worlds. So I just kind of went and and then when I kind of saw how they played different things and, you know, they're like, well, we play our corners inside technique on cover three. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, you know, we don't face any quarterbacks here that can make the throw. <laughs> so we have them come for the run. And I was, and so I, I remember walking up to the head coach and said, Hey, you guys get um, beat on a lot of tall sweeps, don't you? And he's like, yeah. How, why do you say that? I was like, well, because your corners play inside technique on cover three. It's an easy seal route. Like I would check to a sweep every time or run an option because the corners inside is going to get sealed every time. So you might want to consider maybe just having your corner line up outside like he's supposed to and being a force um, so he can come up when he needs to and, and hold the outside contain. And then I just said, you know what? But to your point, there's always that coach looking over sort of like, well, I don't want the NFL guy. And I didn't want to be that guy to yeah. kind of break up the continuity of a program or, or, or come between what somebody's trying to build. I was like, you know what? I'm going to just go over here and, and stay away and just kind of watch football from afar, go to football games and just, just observe and have fun and just watch it with no pressure, no strings. Attached. Sure. I can share with you my first experience as a parent uh, last year, both my sons played flag and the coaching was um, subpar. And, you know, I, I, I can admit, I, I don't know the flag uh, playbook yet. You know, it's, it's six on six and there's some certain rules that I had to kind of, but the clock management Marlon was horrible. <laughs> and, you know, those are things that I feel like at every level you should be able to, you know, function. And, and, and in the one game, our coach forgot that it was fourth down and he called a run. No, that's on not the good. no, no. So, you know, I, I kind of sit off to the court, you know, and the side in the corner and, and nobody, you know, nobody there until later in the year when my son told everybody that I used to be a coaching assistant at the bills and I have a bills podcast. Well, then it was, Oh, you know, you should have been helping from the beginning. And I'm like, no, I, I, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, I, I, I'm certainly not big time, anything like that. And I just, I wanted to let them have fun. And I wanted to try to have fun just watching them. Now, I wouldn't have called it very enjoyable. I was sitting in the corner, you know, the corner of the field muttering about, you know, play design, <laughs> yeah. play call, you know, technique, all that. And this is flag. This is 10 year old flag football. And I finally got to the point where I sat away from my wife and my mother in law because I was, I was chirping under my breath. And I, I, I figured to myself, you know, I'm just going to remove myself here and allow them to have fun and just kind of be the miserable old guy, you know, over in the corner. So I feel your pain there. And, and, and like you said, it's, it's a different, version of football here right like you know yes. there's there are there's no passing you know attacks like there is in ohio or pennsylvania or texas so you've been coaching almost a different sport yes it's it's just the 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 seasons just we have a, a longer football season in ohio just kind of growing up like i always played 11 games before you started the playoffs like you may get six or seven games here and then the playoffs start so it's just it's different and it means that every game matters but you know, there's certain rules by the state of when you can start, when you can't start. You know, I, I've looked at so many things and heard so many things of, you know, coaches do their things. They do passing leagues. And, and I'm not opposed to any of those passing leagues. I think it definitely helps, especially for receivers um, and definitely your secondary and your linebackers. It gives them a head start. And it's just football is just different um, like that. So, you know, the opportunity to really go to a, a, a very large division one school is a little different. And now you've got to go to different places. It's just the way you get to an Ohio state is one, you got to be blessed with size and speed, right? So you got to be running a four, three automatically, uh, you know, and, and, and sometimes you talk to guys here like, well, what's your 40? I don't know. Oh, and, and, and if you can't answer that question, right, then you know what, you probably will not be going to a school like that because you need to be hitting certain 
certain thresholds that they would look at check size check speed um check academics you know and and do some other things and then how are you how's your production uh, productivity on the field so it's just different and by no means am i saying that football here is not good that's not what i'm saying it's just it's just different it was something that i wasn't accustomed to coming from a different state and watching it different um and so sometimes i look i think like you know hey if you try certain things we, we could definitely take some of our athletes and get them into some better scenarios and some better situations, maybe see more guys go up. Cause there is some talent here. We do have a lot of talent, but um, it's just a lack of the longer season sometimes is what really limits the ability to be able to go to different schools and different programs abroad. Um, unless you get to go on and go play in the state playoffs, uh, kind of like some of the schools that are around here now, right? Like, you know, you look at uh, what 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 they're doing uh, down uh, in the city league. There's some schools that definitely um, definitely are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and and they have the talent yep. and the speed, like a, or uh, like a Jamestown or, or yeah, Saint Jamestown Francis. for years. Saint Francis definitely has it, but like when you think about it, like I've seen Saint Francis go and play Ohio schools and Pennsylvania schools, and the score is it, it, it's not pretty, and it's just yeah. because just because of the way and the approach and the longer time that you have to prepare in Ohio. Then, then we do the window here is just different. Um, and so sometimes sure. those windows of when you're allowed to practice, when you're allowed to get together, um, when the season starts, you know, like, like they're, they're playing games in May. Uh, you, you're, you're practicing, I'm sorry, not in May. Yeah, actually school ends in May. You're, you're talking about in August. Like you're getting ready to start back school in August. Yeah. So you have a longer time to kind of do some things when it's warm. You can get a lot more games and uh, it's in, different in priorities, games. right? So th it's they different. Prioritize it's just, it. They prioritize football differently in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, definitely Texas Manor, is on a whole different level. In Florida, um, and the weather, in the weather too. You know, like it gets, it gets, it gets late here early, right? You know, it gets cold. And speaking of a speaking of a team here, you know, before we go, we got to talk about Fran Brown and the Syracuse Orange. Okay. <laughs> Our guy here, you know, Camden High School, which is, you know, an interesting story. And one of my uh, one of my uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, Lean on Me, was not about Camden, but but, you know, one of the other uh, schools in uh, in New Jersey, you know, graduated Camden High School, uh, you know, goes DB coach at Georgia. And he is just killing it at Syracuse. And sure my is. buddy Pat, who I mentioned on the show, you know, uh, professor of sport management there said the buzz around campus is already greater for the football team than it is currently for the basketball team, which is, you know, been their bread and butter for, you know, decades. And they're pulling in guys and, and, and they got your guy. They got Mac Jones yeah. 2.0. Like he's going <laughs> to Syracuse and, and Marlon, if you look at their schedule next year, they are going to be a legit player for the college football playoff. They have a light schedule. Yeah, I mean, and, and you need that, but they have some talent too. Like, you know, they've mm -hmm. got some really good guys. They've got, so they're, they're, you talk about Kyle McCord coming there. And then you look at some of the guys that they got to commit. You know, you've got a tight end from Georgia. You know, you've got a running back. You've got the O line that you need. Like, you've got all, and they've got them from the New Jersey area. Like, they, he went back to his ties and said, I'm, I'm going to go back where I'm known from, go back and get these people. And so he had, had kind of a plan of what he wanted to do. But when you start looking at it, like, he, he's, he's got some players. Like, yeah, Pat, you know, you Pat told me there's been more guys four who stars to come play football at Syracuse. There's been more four stars on campus in the last two weeks than there was in the last 10 years. You know, and it's, it's just interesting because he's another one of those guys like we talked yeah. about, you know, like Marcus Freeman like Deion Sanders. I mean, you can, you know, you can say a lot of different things, but the, the money at Syracuse is never going to be huge. It's not Ole Miss, Texas A&M, Alabama. You're not getting NIL money in central New York like you are in the South. So, so guys are going there for a reason. And, and I'm guessing that Fran Brown is really relatable and, you right. know, he connects with these guys, you know, like you talked about during your, you know, your recruiting time and, and all like, obviously he has some pull and some sway with families and with athletes that he's getting these guys to come to Syracuse, New York to play football, four or five star guys that can kind of name their own place. And next year, Maron, they open with Ohio. They play Army, Holy Cross, UConn, at BC, at Cal, at NC State, at Pitt. And they got home, Georgia Tech, Miami, Stanford, and Virginia Tech. They don't play Clemson, they don't play Florida State, Ooh. and they don't play Miami. So that's a favorable I mean, schedule for year one. Running that's the table, a, yeah. running the table is the not table. out of the question. They they might be favored. Oh, I'm sorry, they do play Miami at home. They might be favored in ten out of those twelve games. And, yeah, and, and, you're and, and, and an can quarterback. You got it, but you've got an yep. experienced quarterback who definitely we're going to find out 
if it was because that, that's the knock on him, right? Was it Marvin Harrison that made him really good, or was it that he just needed to, or was he just as good? You know, he was a five star quarterback, or you could call him a four star quarterback, whatever you want to say, coming out. But definitely, this guy put up numbers in high school. Um, he was solid in his one season at Ohio State as a starter, was in a program. So it's going to be fun to watch. But, you know, you go back to what you're able to do, right? Like he went home where he's from. Obviously, use those relations to say, okay, talk to me. Tell me about a guy who who we should maybe consider that maybe some teams are overlooking, that we're going to give him a chance. And, and that's what you're saying. The guy's like, listen, you come here. I'm looking to change a program. I'm looking to kind of build something that represents our community. I can tell you one thing. He's And I can tell you, he's probably saying the same thing that I would say. I can't promise that all of you are going to start, but I can promise that if you come in here and you work hard, you're going to have the opportunity to come in and compete. You know, I'm not going out to the transfer portal and trying to get stuff. I'm trying to get a base nucleus core players to kind of build a program around so if you're a four-star guy coming in that's what you want to hear because you know in the back of your mind if you consider going to a georgia if you consider going to an alabama you know that they're always going to be reloading they're always going to be bringing five-star guys and there's always going to be uh, guys coming in the portal so it's not that you're afraid of competition what you want is to be there long enough to be like, hey, can I come in and show you what I can? Can I be developed, right? Like, if you think I can yeah. play this next level, but you know you need time, kind of like what John said, you know, he talked about his son, Bruno, like, hey, this is a three-year plan. You've got guys, you can sit down and say, listen, I think you can play at this level. I've got you on a two-year plan. I think if you come here to our school, in two years, you'll be ready to start. In two years, you can be all, all, all league. And in three years, three or four years, you'll be talking about calling your name on Sundays and, and saying this guy was developed here. And that's what you want to some sell guys on as well. Like it's not about the immediate gratification. You can kind of plug and play position that you need right now to make an immediate impact, but you need those guys that are, that are going to be in the program that you can develop and build something with. And I think he got a solid first class. Definitely got a solid yeah. first class. I'm excited. I'm excited to see that. It's it's fun when Syracuse is good. Uh, before we go here, Merlin, I need to uh, ask you about SB Nation. Eight hours ago, the title of the article, even though things haven't been going well for Ohio State, it's not time to panic, but it might be soon. Uh, please give me a, a state of your Buckeyes. I see that they've had a bunch of guys enter the transfer portal, which will happen to every team, but they lost yeah. you know, a five-star defensive line prospect to Miami, five-star O-lineman to Dion in Colorado. Where, where are you at with your Buckeyes right now? I, I'm good. I'm I'm not worried. I I don't panic on any of those things. I mean, they had talent to begin with, uh, and I don't think they lost as many guys as I want to say Georgia or Texas A&M that entered the portal. I want to say they had what twelve or thirteen guys in the portal. You know, I I think what the transfer portal allows guys to do is kind of say, listen, um, is this the right fit for me? Obviously, they felt it wasn't, um, and so I begrudge no one for kind of saying I need to move on and go somewhere else. Like that, that's what the transfer portal is for. So that's what you use it for. I think what you want to look at is when you look at all the signs, and I haven't gone through today, um, I've been kind of looking at it briefly, but Ohio State had a lot of five-star and four-star guys that stuck with their commits. And I want to say the best thing about it is they all have decided to, I want to say at least 12 or 13 of those commits that they had coming in for this 2024 class are all graduating early and enrolling in the school mm -hmm. Um, in January, um, one of them being a five star quarterback uh, in Air Nolan, um, who is who passed over 10,000 yards um, in high school. Um, so he's coming wow. to school. He's going to graduate. He's coming to school. He'll be in school in January. So could Ohio State add a quarterback through the transfer portal? They could. And are they having those conversations with guys who haven't signed elsewhere? Yes, they probably are. But you still have guys coming in. You still have guys that are there that were just as that were five star and four star recruits coming in. So you, you've got a, a couple of five star receivers that are coming in. So I would say they're pretty good. Do guys flip? Yeah. I mean, that happens. That's that's what the name of the game is. And and some guys decide, hey, you know what? This is a better fit for me. Some guys decide to go for more money. I think the guy who flipped and went to Miami um, was for more money. He got more NIL money. So we'll see if that works out for him. It doesn't mean it's going to be the best pathway for him. And he may end up being in the portal in two years. You never know. Yeah. yeah. But that's the nature of the, the college business that we're in. I don't panic too much. You know, it's just you got to figure out how to navigate it. And 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 we'll see. I think the proof is going to be in what that team looks like in September when they play their first game. So, yeah, I just we'll I love the I love the whole narrative around your program. Right? You go 11 <laughs> and one. You got to fire the coach. 
the yeah. whole program's going the wrong way. And now we're panicking because we lose one of like nine five star guys that we have. Like, I just, I always get a kick out of it now doing the show with you. Like, and it's not you, but the angst around Ohio State is just, it's almost unparalleled in college football, right? There's just always angst, you know, unless you win the national yeah. championship, which is just really hard to do. You know, it my is. Irish, it's really hard to do. My Irish, you know, got Riley Leonard, uh, CJ Carr, who's a five star who, who went to, to Michigan. Uh, the grandson of Lloyd Carr uh, is coming on campus as well. So they, they seem to be in a good spot for the next couple of years. It's kind of weird how they're going to have a second, you know, kind of grad transfer from another ACC school. I don't really, I don't love it. You know, you'd rather see a guy come in the program and develop for a couple of years. And he's kind of your guy. Sam Hartman just always felt like wake the wake wake forest quarterback. And now Riley Leonard's, you know, the guy coming in from Duke and, you know, obviously you cheer for him and, and, and hopefully they can make a yeah, run. You, next you'll, year, be, but, you'll be singing his laurels. Oh, of when, course when I passes, will. You know, he's, when he's he passes already for 400 yards and be like, yes, Riley Leonard. That's my he's guy. already, I, I he's it. already, he's already more athletic than, uh, than, than Sam ever was. And, and thank goodness we've gone into the, transfer portal and we, we've picked up a couple of functional college receivers because that was a gruesome passing offense that I had to watch this year. And it was, Absolutely, it was, it was tough. Yeah. And, and with Sam not being the most mobile quarterback, you know, they kind of pieced it all together with, with my guy, Audric Estime, who, you know, has opted out to the NFL and, and hopefully he continues the run of great Notre Dame running backs so that Kyron Williams, man, he is tearing up the league and yes, he's so he much is. fun to watch. And I, I always root for him because he was, you know, he was a great player in Notre Dame. And, you know, kind of embodied everything that those teams, you know, with Ian Book and, and Brian Kelly were able to accomplish. So any uh, any final thoughts for us here, Marlon, before we, uh, you know, head into the Christmas holiday? Uh, you know, the uh, the bowl game season kind of takes a little bit of a break this week and then really fires up next week. We'll be yeah. back to preview a bunch of those games and then, you know, start talking about the playoff. Any uh, any final thoughts for everybody? No, I mean, I think you hit it well. I I just want to thank everyone for listening. I thank everyone for tuning in on, on all these seasons and or all these episodes that we've had. And and definitely just enjoy the holiday season. Happy holidays. Happy New Year to every one of you. Um, we look forward to um, – I know I look forward to spending time with my family. I hope you have a great time with your family. Um, for sure. And just, it's, and it's an you know, NFL bonanza this weekend. You know, oh, man, Christmas, I can't wait. Yes. Christmas being on a Monday, it's like there's a game tomorrow night, you know, or the, the Thursday night game. And then, yep. you know, there's the two Saturday. games on Saturday, including the hometown Sunday. team in a must win. Then there's all day Sunday. There's even a Christmas Eve night game, the Patriots and the Broncos. And then there's three games on Christmas Day. It's like, man, if if I can if I can not get divorced this weekend, I I've made it through. <laughs> I've made it through the gauntlet, right? Like, right, this is have. a this is a all football weekend over Christmas. It's going to be, uh, you know, college football takes a little bit of backseat for a week, and then uh, it's okay. It's I'll, I'll let that college football take a backseat. We'll be saying go Bills because I'm gonna yes. go ahead and throw this for once in here. Go Bills. Um, you know, keep it rolling. Let's let's do what we need to do. Um, there and come back and have those two games remaining against the Patriots and the Dolphins. Um, but definitely, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be loaded and locked to the TV on Saturday night. I'll be loaded and locked at the football games on Sunday. Uh, and then Christmas, it'll be a coin toss of which game I watch. I'll be hanging with family and just eating food and trying to build those memories of just my kids are older now. So now it's kind of fun to be like, who's cooking on dinner? Who's helping make nice. this dinner? Who's doing that? So it's going to be a lot more fun to kind of do those, have those conversations and set up some new memories. And, like and we'll be doing a watch party um, Saturday night. So somebody's bringing a dip, I think, um, for one of the games. So we'll see which one's bringing a dip and who's making Beautiful. it. Beautiful. So that fun. works. I look forward to those days. This is um, no spoilers here, Marlon, but this is the first Christmas for my boys um, with the certain knowledge of things and how the world works. Uh, them now being 11. They, uh, <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were smartened up this year to the Christmas holiday. And um, I'm going to see how they take it. They, one of them seems pretty disappointed that, uh, you know, the magic of the season is, is, has been lost gotcha. in some ways. Gotcha. For them. <laughs> so we're going to, uh, the nice thing is that kind of lowers the expectations and, and maybe some of the prices and some of the, some of the, the credit card bills after the season's over. Cause you know, exactly. Hey, you know, mom and dad are buying presents now. So, <laughs> you know, a little more accountability. So we'll uh, everybody please like, and subscribe. Uh, follow John Fina on, on Twitter X. If, if you don't, his show is great with Joe Miller. Joe Miller is a great guy. We had him on our show with Don and uh, Marlon. We'll see, we'll see everybody next week. See you next week. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to every one of you.